but God has a, a message just on my heart tonight. A verse, a few verses, and a thought, and I just want to give it to you. Uh, thank you so much. I came with an empty piece of paper this week um, that I kept in my Bible, and I've been last night, this morning. By the way, I want to introduce you all to my son, Preston, there. Wave at everybody. This is my oldest boy, Preston. He's 10 years old, and last minute he said, can I go? And uh, one of the perks of homeschooling. And so I said, grab your books, and yeah, come on. And so uh, we haven't got any school done since he's been here, but uh, again, one of the perks of homeschooling. <laughs> my brother has the sticker on the back of his van that says, my children are homeschooled. I have no idea how they're doing. And uh, <laughs> so uh, that's kind of how we are. I brought a piece of paper, and I said, all right, Lord, just do as you've done so many times before, and just uh, fill the paper, fill the notes. I think it's good for a person to be prepared. Uh, I think that's, that's right. And the Lord just kept my paper empty. And I have a paper, and it's got notes on it. And it's, let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to turn around and preach it, but that's what my notes are right here. So uh, that's, you're either in trouble, because preachers, uh, I've noticed that the longer... We study the shorter we preach. Have you noticed that? It's true, actually. Uh, for me, the dross kind of keeps coming off. The shorter I study, the longer I tend to preach because I, t- I tend to chase, chase all the rabbits. But the Lord started doing a work in my heart of emptying me of who I am. And I think that's kind of the theme a little bit of what we're getting this week or these last couple of days. Um, I, I love my uncle and, and, and what he preached last night. And I'm not George Griffiths. I'm not going to even try to be anybody tonight. I just, uh, I'm so thankful for all of it, the faithfulness we heard about this morning. Um, you know, I don't care who I am, Zelotes or whatever. I can't say his name either. Um, what's, what's all that, the theme of this thing? And, um, you know, I think when you go back and read Psalm 116, the psalmist said, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's interesting that in the context, and context usually kills all, our, all of our theology most of the time. But um, I don't know if he's talking about dying necessarily, like the physical death. He says, I will make sacrifices unto the Lord. I think it's a little bit of a precursor to Romans chapter 12. Uh, I beseech you, brethren, that, by the mercy, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't really understand it all. But I know this. God wants us to die. I know, I didn't expect that. Let not your heart be troubled. God wants you to die. <laughs> As my pastor said growing up, cheer up, you'll soon be dead. I love that. <laughs> Brother Clark, he'd say, cheer up, you'll soon be dead. <laughs> he preached to a bunch of Baptists. And um, he has been in a process of getting me to a place of emptying me. So my life has just been a constant process of desiring to play all those instruments and uh, seeing somebody think, I want to do that, and God gave me a little bit of ability, and so I, I learned the instruments, and I, I want to be able to do that thing, and so then I, I pursue it, and God lets me do it. And what I find in those things is none of those things give me joy and peace and contentment in life. Um, and God just kind of lets me do a lot of things. I remember thinking uh, I, my dream was to build an instrument one day. I was a, I'm a woodworker, and I play uh, instruments and I thought I'd love to build an instrument so four years ago I built a dobro and if you don't know what a dobro is then uh, you need to be checking out man you're in, you're in Murfreesboro but a, but a dobro and I, I built one and and now I've built 45 of them I mean and they people are buying it. it's the craziest thing in the world and someone played in one of mine in the Grand Ole Opry and I, they sent me pictures man that's your guitar on the Grand Ole Opry and I just remember looking at the picture and thinking I don't even care I really don't. I mean, it's just neat. I think the Lord might use it to, to, to reach people or whatever. But my whole life is this constant process of he must increase, I must decrease. Is that what your life is? Sadly, I think I've met some older people sometimes that they just kind of plateaued. And it's like, you know what? I'm, I, I, yeah, I've reached that. But we never reach that. I, I've never attained. Paul said, I pressed toward the mark. I had not attained a constant emptying of ourself and Christ being more and more exalted. Brother, Alan, when you said this morning, do you ever think about loving the Lord with all your heart? Brother, that's almost all I think about. I mean it. 
I think, I don't, I know I don't. I remember standing over his crib when he was a newborn and, and praying over him that God would save him and that God would use him and, and just looking at him and just adoring him as I still do. I, I love my son. And um, I say he's, he's my best friend. You know, I, I can't think, you know, I know my wife's my best friend, but I mean, he's, he's my friend and uh, he's a friend I get to spank. It's, it's a crazy thing. Um, <laughs> he's like, you don't treat me like your friend. Uh, Never seen you spanking up on your friends. I want to, man. I, believe me, if I could whip my clients, I'd do it. Uh, I remember standing over his crib and um, praying, and it was as if the Lord, and it was through his word, and he does that. He speaks to us through his word, and sometimes it's almost audible, but it's just through his word, through his spirit in us. Um, but I looked at, I was looking at my son, and, and, the, and it was like the Lord stood in that room with me and said, I wish you loved me like you love him. And that's a hard place to come to because the answer is not Abraham, right? Okay, Lord, I'll sacrifice him to you. And I just got on my knees that night and said, God, I don't even know how to do that. By the way, I think it'd be good for all of us to start to learn how to talk to God. I, I'm learning, but uh, we, we, we try to come to him in some kind of facade like he doesn't know our hearts. And, um, but I just got on my knees and said, Lord, I don't know how to love you. And so he said, I'll teach you. <laughs> I'll teach you how to love me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. And so I've just been learning that. I'm just in this process of going from this teenage punk, I guess you could say. I don't know if that's appropriate or anything. Everything's wrong any, anymore. You can't say anything. And so um, and I think I was a punk. I, other people have uh, agreed with that. I, I never saw it. But um, from this, Brother Larry's agreeing with it. You didn't even know me when I was a teenager. <laughs> oh, you're saying I still am. Um, to emptying and emptying and emptying and emptying. And just when you think you can't be more empty, he empties. He empties. And I was reading this passage. I want to read these verses to you and just give you a, a couple thoughts that I have, and then I'm just going to be done. And so I, I don't know how to do this. This is weird for me. I usually have, you know, I want to finish the thing with a poem. And maybe the Lord will give me a poem right in the middle of it. Roses. If I say roses are red, violets are blue, at the end, you'll know it was just made up. But looking for uh, 2 Corinthians. Verse 3, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. I mean, do you get what he's saying right here? He's saying we're afflicted, but we're comforted, but we're not comforted for us. He's so empty of himself right here that he's saying my comforting wasn't even for me. It was so I could turn around and comfort you. This man is emptied, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted it is for your consolation, whether we be comforted is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as we are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye also be of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, listen to what he says here. Have you ignorant? Sounds familiar to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, they were ignorant about some things, and he didn't want them to stay that way. But this is what he didn't want them to stay ignorant about. Of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, a lot of commentaries say that he's referring to um, Acts chapter 19. And if you remember, the, you should go back and read chapter 19 at some point. Uh, maybe even tonight. I, I love it. I love... Um, how they are, they're preaching the gospel and they're, they're suffering persecution. They gather there in Ephesus and they're, uh, they're worshiping Diana and they're saying these Christians and they're, they're hating them because it's, what, it, what it's doing is it's, it's turning people from Diana to the Lord Jesus Christ and the people that were making money off of it didn't like that. And so they, they get this great gathering together and they bring these, these Jews in, they bring these Christians in and they're questioning them. And Paul goes to go in the middle of them, man. Paul was not afraid of it. He goes to meet with them and they keep him. No, Paul, don't go in there. Don't go in there. And then in the middle of it all, uh, they were ready to kill him. But uh, the clerk stands up and he says, hey, um, 
you know, if we're going to do this, it's got to be done in a lawful way. And he dismisses the congregation, that these people that had got together in this theater. Um, I mean, just as real life stuff, okay? I know what sometimes we think. I, I kind of laugh sometimes at us because uh, all of our eschatology is uh, centered around America. Like, oh, man, we're starting to see some crazy stuff. And I, sometimes I, I want to go, tell all these people that have been beheaded for their faith in the last thousand years. Like, oh, persecution starting to ramp up. It is starting to ramp up, but it's always been, right? I mean, they're experiencing it right here. And we're thinking, well, Lord's close to coming back. Well, he, I hope he is. I believe he is. Uh, but, uh, and I don't, I mean, some of y'all could walk circles around me with all of the theology and the doctrines about that. But I know this. Everyone that's ever lived godly in Christ Jesus has suffered persecution for it. And some of them death. So he's in the middle of this in Asia. And uh, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant that these, listen to these sufferings. He said that we were pressed out of measure. You know, we like the press part when we're talking about giving. You know, pressed, shaken down, pressed but this says I was, we were pressed, pressed, we were emptied. There was no more pressing we could take above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. Have you ever been there before? I'll tell you, I'm 39 years old and I've got, I think, I think I got it made. But man, God's brought me to places in my life where I'll say, Lord, I, can I just go home? And you say, that's crazy. But. I'm telling you, it's a battle to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But man, there's great consolation in loving the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think we've lied to people sometimes. Like, it's not going to be hard to serve Christ. No, it's going to be impossible to serve Christ. That's the whole point of what he does. So he can, and by the way, if you think it's easy to serve Christ, then I wonder if you're serving Christ. Honestly. Men, we, we must be reminded it is not easy. And I'm 39 and I'm on the front side if the Lord tarries is coming. I'm on the front side of where some of you all are. And I, I respect your age and, and I, I'm so grateful for your uh, example. But I just tell my wife the other day, I said, man, if the Lord tarries, I could be doing this for 40 more years. And the dentist told me the other day, he said, uh, well, a couple months ago, I got a new dentist. And he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a pastor. And he said, yeah, you got pastor's teeth. I thought he meant I, you could tell I drank too much coffee. He goes, no, you smile all day. And he said, but you grind your teeth all night, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do, actually, I think. My wife tells me all the time. She wakes me up because I'm grinding my teeth. Because you never stop thinking about the ministry. You never stop thinking about people. And it will press you down. And it will, it will get to a place where you'll despair of the life. And I just said, Lord, the other day, Lord, if, if, th if this is what you want me to do, please, I am happy to do it. But I don't want to get to the end and go, and the Lord say, no, that wasn't my will for you. I just want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All right. But I'm, at, I'm 39. I, I could still maybe go into a different career at this point, you know, and, and I would be lying if I say I didn't consider that at times. You know, 26 more years in something uh, in a different field and actually have retirement. Amen. Because <laughs> what's independent Baptist way forget the retirement, man. Now, thankfully, I didn't opt out of Social Security. It will not be in existence by that time. I understand that. But I'm, you know, thank the Lord, every 15% and the church can't pay their 7.5%. I'm paying it all. Lord, is this what you want me to do? Because I press down. Press down. Listen to what he says. But we, and this, this just stuck out to me. And maybe one of you need to stand up and preach it. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. You know, that's the only time I've been looking. I've been thinking about that, that phrase right there. I've been thinking about it. That's the only time it's mentioned like this. It's It's amazing. The sentence of death. It's a judicial term that there was a death sentence in themselves. That's what Paul said. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. Paul was serving out a death sentence. And I want to encourage you today, and it's not encouraging maybe, but keep serving out your death sentence, guys. This life is not about, and ladies, it's not about us. It's not about us. And I've learned as pastor, my desires and my wants for the church have to be laid aside. Because, hey, let's be honest, man. It's my generation that spent half the day down today at Starbucks with their skinny jeans and their MacBook. Now, I have skinny jeans because every pair of jeans I have are tight, but that's for a different reason. And I have a, I have a MacBook, all right, because I, I got sick of buying uh, these other computers, PCs, every other year. So I have a MacBook. Um, but my generation, you know, we got this crazy idea that 
But, but, what, but what, God, what is God wanting out of us? What, what does God want? He wants us to serve people. He wants us to love people. He says this sentence of death we had in ourselves for a reason, right? Now, I don't understand completely what he means by this sentence of death. By the way, I think there's a difference between when, the, when, the, when someone says, I'm going to kill you, and when you put a sentence of death in yourself. He said, we put this in it. We acknowledge this sentence of death. We, as a judge, said the sentence of death is upon us. They had a sentence of death that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. And that's something he's talking about the physical. I know he's talking about physical death right here. But I tell you right now, it's something getting to a point in your life where you say, you know what, Lord? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My wife don't like it when I talk that way because I'm, I'm 39, okay? I'm 30. I'm a baby is what I'm saying. I'm not saying that like I've got some experience. 39 years old. And I'll look at my wife and say, man, I'm just ready to go home. And she's like, I don't like when you say that because it sounds like you don't like me. And I'm like, no, I want you to go with me. And then she starts getting scared and, you know, locking up all the guns and stuff. But this world, my, I was kind of getting there with the whole skinny pants thing. But my, my, my guys, guys I grew up around, man, they get in the ministry. And it's just like whoever they're listening to that week on the radio or whoever listened to that week on podcast, that's who they think is the example. And man, and by the way, before we're just quick to throw them all out. Christ did say, if they're not against me, they're for me, okay? So we better be careful how we throw people out that are, that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ just because they did things different. But I'm thankful for men of, ahead of me. And I tell all the people all the time, I'm independent Baptist today, not because of John R. Rice and because of all those men, but because of the men that I know that I followed and the example they left. I'm thankful for that. But don't get mad at everybody sometimes when they leave. What are we to do? See, what happens is, you know what we're showing when we get mad at people like that? We're showing we love ourselves more than we love them. We love our ideas better. It's hard to get upset with what everybody else is doing when your eyes are fixed on the Savior. When you've died to yourself. Is this not a New Testament thought? I die daily. Daily. And I think about Paul. This, Paul was learning this. Paul was learning that from uh, something changed from this point where he says, we despaired of life. We had a sentence of death in ourselves. Something happened from there to 2 Timothy Paul, right? Remember 2 Timothy Paul? He said, I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. The race is done, okay? And, and, in, and in maybe days he was about to be beheaded. We know that. But I just know this, we have a sentence of death. And I don't know what that means to you, and I don't even want to expound on it and just try to ramble on about it. But this life is not about us. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, he said, and by the way, I love the terminology. Remember Philippians chapter 2? I'm going to, I'm going to turn back here and read it real quick. i got to go to the front of the Bible here. I'm not used to having a Bible with pages. I have a, uh, an iPad that has a Bible on it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That was a joke. I'm, I love slamming my generation. I live in a trailer, and I'm overweight, and I'm a millennial. So I have a, I have a lot of jokes. I make, fat, I make fun of fat people that live in trailers, and the millennials. I just make fun of everybody, so you just have to forgive me. But verse 1 of Philippians chapter 2, if there be any consolation. Isn't this interesting? Same talk he's talking with second. And this is the same. What happened? Paul took some missionary journeys and Paul was just ready to go, man. Acts, they send him out and he's going. And, but man, he himself was learning that he was dying. He was constantly having to learn that. We got this idea that Paul just arrived. Need I remind you that Jesus Christ himself was serving a death sentence? He was. Now, I don't know your eschatology again. That's one of those big debates everybody's talking about right now. And this whole thing of persecution coming has just all thrown us all off, you know. Because, again, because America, we've never seen tribulation. And so we figured, well, okay, well, maybe, maybe we'll see some tribulation. Well, yeah, I mean, no, no doubt about it. But if, but if our doctrine of eschatology, the end times, teaches us um, that the, the words of Jesus Christ... How important the words of Jesus Christ. And, and what, is, what, is, 
Christ saying. What, what did Jesus come to do? If our eschatology teaches us that Jesus had no intent of coming to this earth and dying, and there's people that teach this, that he came to set up a kingdom, and they rejected him. And so he said, well, I guess I'll go to plan B. I'll die for the sins of man. Do we believe that? I don't know if we believe that. Maybe we do believe that. Maybe we need to have a conference. But I believe this. Jesus was the Messiah. He came to save his people from their sins. And how was that, sin, how was that supposed to happen? Through the death on the cross. From his day one, he had a death sentence in him. From day one. And you say, I've never heard anybody believe like that. Well, you need to come where I am, man, because people, it's going everywhere. And they start questioning the teachings of Jesus Christ. His teachings are not for me. But praise God, I follow Christ. I realize everything he said was not applicable to, directly to me. I'm not, and I'm not an idiot. I mean, I'm kind of an idiot. But uh, he said, he, he came, what, what did he come to do? He came to save their people from their sins, to seek and to save that which was lost, to die on the cross for our sins. And he says, verse 1 here, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Isn't this awesome? This consolation, Paul. Paul was talking about 2 Corinthians. He's talking about it here. What was Christ saying to these disciples in John chapter 14? I'm about to go die, but they weren't comforting him. I'm going to go die. There was no comfort for him. What did he do in his dying? He was comforting them. It's amazing. And that's what Paul's saying. Our death taught me to comfort you. And Jesus' death taught him to comfort those around him. All the way even till after his death, where Peter denied him. And I love how Christ comforted Peter. Peter had turned his back on Christ. He says, do you love me more than these as he's cooking the fish? And Peter says, yes, you know I love you. And he says, then feed my lambs. Where have we stopped learning that our life, my life is about two things. It is about Christ and about feeding his sheep. It is about Christ and his sheep. Christ and his sheep. It is not about me. And I would love to make it about me. I love to make it about me, man. But it's not about me. And so he keeps pressing me out. He keeps pressing me out. He keeps just in, the, in that moment of despair. I'm just like, Lord, take me home or let me do something else. He says, that's what I want to hear. And he just he just keeps giving me grace. He just keeps giving me his word. I'm like that dumb pastor that takes a, a basket to the Lord every week. And this is what I do. And I suggest it. I think it's I don't know where I learned it, but. I just, I just, I bring a basket to the Lord and I think like he was feeding those 5,000 and I bring my basket and I say, what do you want your sheep to eat this week? Feed your sheep. I'm not feeding your sheep my food. I'm feeding them your food. So you tell them, tell me what they, what they need, not what they want, not what I think they want. And he every week feeds my basket. That's why it's so annoying to me that I don't have my proverbial basket filled out right now, but I just feed his sheep and and they're eating. One preacher said, feed, uh, feed the sheep and they'll fall you off a cliff. Amen. We got this thing in Independent Baptist. I guess we think that we're, we're so afraid of man worship. I, I haven't yet met any of these men that people did worship men. I, I've not met any of them that demanded that they worship um, them. So that's a subject in itself, I understand. But I know this. You know why they loved those men so much? Because they fed them. When you got saved, who fed you? Man, you love that person. And we're to feed these people. And so Paul's saying here, if there's any consolation, any comfort, Christ wants to comfort. And he looked at Peter, and I love how he comforted him. Feeding my lambs. You love me more than these? These fish? You left, me, you left what I would called you to do to go fishing, but do you love me? Christ is always telling me, do you love me more than those guitars out there in your shop in the backyard? So right now that shop has not been walked in in three weeks. I locked the door and said, I don't, I don't, I have no desire. I got 25 people waiting on Dobro's, but I don't even care. I tell my wife all the time, I want to burn the thing down. I, I don't want that thing to get in between what God has put me on this earth to do. And then things will slow down and God will say, okay, go build a Dobro. And so I'll go build a Dobro, you know, and have a good time doing it. Preston will go out there with me. And uh, he peels the tape off when I'm putting the binding on. And I'm talking weird stuff to you right now. You don't know what I'm talking about. Brother Allen can do it. I can do it too. I was going to preach on tonight how to, how to make a pumpkin spice latte uh, to kind of combat his. Because I don't know what he was talking about with horses. But I know lattes, man. And so I just didn't think it would be very manly. He tells Peter, feed my sheep. He looks at him again the third time. He denied him three times. And I just love how he's, he gave him three times. To confess his love for him. 
And I love that he didn't say, you know, the Bible says, if a man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. He doesn't say, if a man love not the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might. You notice he said that? He didn't say that. He just said, if a man loves not, do you love him today? Well, a lot of times we don't love him like we should because we love our life. We love our life too much. We're trying to find our own life. If there's any consolation. And he says, be the same mind. That's what Paul's saying in Philippians chapter 2. Be like-minded. What mind? The mind of Jesus Christ. What was the mind of Jesus Christ? He put on the form of a servant. And the whole thing ends, this sentence ends with, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That is what we have in common with Christ. That is what we have in common right here, men and ladies. We're all willing to give our lives for Christ. But if we're not willing to, if, if we think we're willing to die for him when someone puts a gun to our head, how come we're not willing to die for him when we wake up in the morning and want to, want to watch whatever we want to watch on TV or want to do whatever we want to do or whatever, put whatever we want? No, death doesn't come. That death comes today. The sentence of death he comforted Peter. And he says, he knew he loved him. He, he confessed that love. And, he, and I love Peter. You remember Peter said, I'll die for you. I would die for you. And then he didn't even make it. He said, actually, you're going to deny me three times tonight. And he looks at Peter. And Peter, he says, uh, when you were young, you girded, you know, you, you know, this, you know, the, you know what he told him? He said, but when you're old, they're going to stretch out your hands. And the Bible tells us he told him that to signify which death he would die. The only apostle that he told, you're going to die for me. Peter started serving out a death sentence that day. He says, I'm going to die for Christ. Are you willing to die for Christ tonight? I want to be. I'm not. I don't. I got to every day. Every day I get up, I got to look at myself in the mirror and I'm reminded of all of my regrets in life. And all my regrets came from doing what I wanted to do. And I'm just learning. And I hope you're learning, too. We just give our lives to Christ. Serve out our death sentence. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Um, I hope. I hope you did something in someone's heart like you've done in mine through this to just uh, give our lives to you. I think it's what you're doing in our hearts this week. I think it's what one of the reasons uh, that you've allowed COVID to just empty us a little bit more. Lord, even Christ, our Savior, in the very last moments said, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, Oh, it's a hard thing. And you are, you are touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You know what it's like to face death. And sometimes it would be easier to face a physical death than it would to face a daily giving of ourselves to you. Oh, Father, help us in this. I just pray that you'll move in our hearts, that you'll work in our hearts. In Christ's name, amen.